So, um, I know it's very early uh, for some of us, uh, including myself, because, uh, because of the party, of course, the Russian party, but um, I want to welcome you to the session, a session about Central Mediterranean prehistory at the EAA 25 third. Uh, research advances a new direction organized by myself, uh, Guillaume, um, Marianne, Francesco, and Maya. All the names are here. Um, the aim of the session is to take stock of the advances made in the um, study of Central Mediterranean prehistory in the last 25 years, uh, capture the most innovative research being carried out these days, and help share the agenda of this important field of studies for the next 25 years. Maybe that's a bit over-optimistic, shall we say 10 years, I'd be happy with that, to be honest. Um, as you know, the Central Med is one of the most uh, intensively researched regions of prehistoric Europe. But debate is often hindered by hyper-specialization, as well as disciplinary and country boundaries, uh, discouraging comparative, cross-subject and cross-period research. And today, we will try to overcome these barriers to the free flow of ideas and foster a new season of um, interdisciplinary research and debate, engaging all researchers interested in this region, wherever they may be based, and whatever their background and intellectual standing may be. This is going to be a fairly long session, and so I'm asking all speakers to stick to their allocated 15 minutes. Uh, if you're shorter than that, than that um, there will be time for um, a few questions, but uh, otherwise, please hold your fire, and we're going to have three debate slots, evenly spaced out throughout the day, so all questions and discussions are for those, uh, for those slots, please. Um, we also have a poster uh, for this session. It's not here in this room. It will be in the poster area outside. Uh, but I encourage you to take a look at the poster, and uh, I'm not sure we have the author in the room, uh, but if so, uh, feel free to ask them questions. Um, the <clears throat> you've probably been uh, um, informed about this. The session is being recorded, but there's an option. All, all uh, powerpoints or presentations are being recorded, but there's an option to opt out. So there's a sign-in sheet here. And uh, if you're speaking, could you please uh, put a yes or a no and a signature uh, next to your name to make sure the organizers, the conference organizers, know about uh, your choice. Uh, I, think, I think the idea is to record all the session and then to take out those uh, presentations that don't want to be recorded. Um, there are three main, uh, if you like, uh, themes uh, that um, we've... Um, 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 uh, we've organized the sessions are according to three main uh, uh, themes. Uh, the first, uh, which is kind of loosely, if you like, uh, understood, the first is technology, so, so the first few papers are about technology. Uh, the second batch is about landscape and monuments, and the third batch is about scientific advances. But as I said, this is a loose organization of, of, of the presentations, and um, uh, the main thing is to foster debate across those disciplinary um, and area and period boundaries. Um, so it's not certainly in chronological order or any geographical order either. So, so uh, it befalls uh, me this morning to um, start this uh, um, session with a brief, uh, if you like, review of uh, what was the state of the art for Central Mediterranean studies about 25 years ago. And we had the first EAA uh, conference in the mid 1990s. Um, and to get a sense of how things have changed in the last 25 years. And um, it's a bit of a scary thought for me, to be honest, that this period, 25 years, coincides more or less with my career, if I include my um, uh, university years. Uh, um, but uh, in a way, it makes the, the, the work easier. Um, I go back, uh, if, I, if I go back to my university years, it, back in Italy in the 1990s, certain dominant themes and idiosyncratic approaches to research immediately spring to mind. Uh, in many respects, prehistoric studies were still dominated by an obsession for two materials and classes of artifacts. I'm kind of overly uh, simplifying things here. 
but uh, but it is in many it was in many respects uh, true that if you were a paleo mass specialist you would focus on lithic tools and if you're a late prehistory specialist uh, you would focus on pottery metals just being for the lucky few um, I, I was stuck with pottery so if you're wondering um, <coughs> and um, um, <coughs> By and large, the evidence was afforded a narrow and quite normative research approach. At Italian universities, for example, uh, perhaps elsewhere too, um, student dissertations and research theses often consisted of a bunch of material, materials to study. You would approach your supervisor and he would say, oh, there's a cemetery, there's a settlement, or there's a bunch of, there's a collection, a bunch of stuff for you to study. And to study, it turned out, uh, it meant a very specific, very narrow thing. Um, it was uh, uh, consisted of classifying, drawing, and making sense of the stuff through comparanda, aiming to establish chronological and cultural frameworks for this stuff. Uh, the research was not very uh, much question-driven, but uh, was material-driven. Uh, and its outcome was ponderous, but sometimes a bit mind-dumbing, uh, volumes full of typological tables and detailed appraisals of individual pot shirts. It was the last wrap of culture history. Um, and of course, um, I, I'm probably being ungenerous, it is a partial uh, and quite uncharitable picture of prehistoric studies in the 1990s. Uh, new ideas were of course uh, already stirring back then and new methods were being applied, but often in a sort of disorderly and intellectually innocent way. Radiocarbon, for example, was growing in importance at the time, but people were not totally clear about what to do with the new dates that were coming, coming out thick and fast. Or, oh, another example, a new interest in landscape archaeology was growing at the time. All of a sudden, everyone was doing landscape and GIS. Of course, I was still stuck with pottery. Um, or other scientific methods were, applying, were being applied to archaeological uh, problems. Yet the problems themselves uh, were, often, um, were often the same as before. Social complexity, state formation, things that had been debated since the 1980s and still dominated the research agenda uh, in later prehistory. At least. Uh, mm, it was very much a case of new methods being applied to old problems. And science playing a secondary or ancillary role to archaeology, not driving the agenda. And if you think of, about the role of science now, 25 years on, with the scientists in the front seat and the archaeologists struggling to get control of, of the steering wheel, it's very much uh, uh, it's, it, it's sort of an inversion of roles. Uh, so, so things have changed a lot. Um, it was also a world in which debate followed national agendas and country boundaries by and large. Uh, and consider how the new social problems that started being debated in Britain at the time, gender, the body, the ancestors, were largely ignored in Italian and other continental research traditions. And in these areas too, of course, we have made enormous strides. So Marianne is now presenting some of these uh, uh, <laughs> some of these strides and breakthroughs of the last 25 years. Yeah, thanks Andrea. Yeah, we, what, what I'd like to talk about today is um, some of the most uh, relevant advances that we have made in this field in the past 25 years. This, in this respect, obviously I'm going to speak about archaeological science first, which moved forward significantly because methods have improved, analytical costs have dropped down, and procedure have increased. And experts in the field have managed to, probably more than elsewhere in archaeology, to share data and information in the best interest of the discipline. For example, through data repositories, web platforms, etc., etc. As an example, in this case, for example, Pinazi and, Al and, and Tal's work in 2015 on optimal DNA yield linked to extraction from the Petrus bone has boosted ancient DNA projects that have increased by over 300% in the last 55 years. And I'm saying 300%, but really, I think it's more than that. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting. This has, however, triggered some legitimate second thoughts on the utility and purpose of destructive analysis. Only a few years, a few uh, days ago, 
Her comment on nature invited the scientific community to a greater sense of responsibility when managing ancient remains. I don't know if anybody of you have read this, but it's like, okay, it's a cautionary tale about what we should do with the bones, whether we should use them simply or maybe think twice before we actually go and deep extract DNA from everything, basically. But despite some criticism, it is beyond doubt that the past 25 years have witnessed a transition of archaeological science from the ancillary role of providing data to support bigger questions to a milieu where actually questions are formed, shaped, and sometimes revolutionized through science. The interest of the scientific community in the discipline is also witnessed by the increasing number of journals on the subject, which have now become a desired target for publication for most of us. From isolated case studies, we have refined our sample strategy, humans and faunas, then botanical remains, then further compounds. We have also widened our research horizons that went from, for example, extremely small scale resolution to large cultural phenomena. The use of archaeological science, in fact, has triggered new debates, precisely in the central Mediterranean, I should say, where evidence of the consumption of new or different resources, for example, appear to be a key issue. Let's think about the Middle Paleolithic and the Neanderthal food consumption around Europe or the millet question that we all know, know, know about. Then connectivity has grown into one of the main subjects of research discussing in the central Mediterranean region, following suggestions firstly advanced by Knapp and Blake some 15 years ago, which in turn were based on the seminal work by historians Horden and Purcell, Connectivity has in fact developed into a meta theme for research in the Mediterranean prehistory, complementing other strands of social and economic studies and creating a new paradigm for explaining several interrelated social dynamics in the prehistory of the Middle Sea. Network approaches developed in the last few years have provided the opportunity to formalize analysis of ancient connectivity in a way that can help scholars formulate new research questions and hypotheses. The starting point of this approach is that connection are more, uh, sorry, uh, are more important than individual identities. This has played a major role in revitalizing traditional typological work, extending its exploratory and explanatory power to previously understudied social dynamics. And yet, this new interest in network analysis carries the risk of losing sight of human agency and social dynamics behind nodes and edges. Can network thrive without some sort of theoretical assumption and explicit ideas about how society work in the effect of interaction? The answer is probably no, and one of the future challenges we face is to inject network analysis with new explanatory models regarding prehistoric society. <coughs> Another theme developed in the last 25 years is island archaeology and seascapes. In the 1990s, research approaches still had a processual outlook with a strong emphasis on model testing, quantification, and generalization. Considerable weight has placed on ecological and environmental factors. The last two decades have seen new definition of seascape behind introduced, emphasizing um, the behavior and perception of the people living on island. The same years saw a collapse of faith in the biogeographic notion of island as bounded naturally defined areas for investigation. One of the most important studies in this respect is that of Helen Dawson, which explores the complexity of Mediterranean islands colonization, looking into multi-factor explanation and previously neglected demographic issue. There are, of course, many other themes and problems that were newly explored in the last 25 years, but we have no time to touch upon all of them here. Many of these will be discussed in the following papers, along with new data and research avenues that are being opened just now. So thank you, let's go on with it. <laughs>